Let us pray again. Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to you. And we ask that you would say the things to us that you desire. That you would form in us that which we so desperately need. So we say to us, oh, speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. <coughs> Amen. that when we hear them, at least this is my experience, I feel a tremendous sense of peace. You know, like, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you, or I will give you rest. I think all of us could sign up for that one. Uh, I'm ready. I, I need that right now. There are other scriptures that, in fact, have precisely the opposite effect. Uh, they are meant to drive us to our knees. They are meant to face us in a very kind of cold light. All of our incapacity to be able to serve and to be faithful. To point to us in a way that most of us wish wasn't true. How desperately we actually need God. Those are the scriptures this morning. So I, I must say to you that I can't begin this morning by saying, here's a great word for you until we get close to the end. It's almost as if the scripture has to tell us the bad news so that we have enough room inside us to receive the good news. Because you see, in every instance, but particularly in the Deuteronomy reading, the Psalm, and in the Gospel, they're meant to show us in a very, very profound way our incapacity to be able to do the things that God asks of us. God is going after with tooth and nail every single bit of our own self-sufficiency, our own pride in our own accomplishments, our ability to brag on who we are and what we do. He, he's just coming after us that way. I mean, it gets so explicit. Did you hear the line? It was sung beautifully, but it has, it's almost... Shaky, if you hear it. Happy are they who never do anything wrong, but always walk in his ways. If that doesn't produce a long face in you, I'm not sure what might. <laughs> I mean, the whole point of these scriptures, you see, is to show us that here are God's decrees, and they're way up here. Can I do them? Absolutely not. In other words, it would be an extraordinary mistake for me to come to you this morning like a cheerleader and in essence say, come on, we can do this one together. Are we in it? Yeah, we are. Here we go. Let's go do it. Because inevitably, the commands of God are so big and so high that we fall. And if all you heard is that kind of cheerleading moralism, just try harder, you know, you can do this. And there are churches that are famous for that kind of an approach to the Christian life. The inevitable result is just guilt. Finally, cynicism, because it's just too big. So why bother? <clears throat> but it's God we're talking about here. So I can't just say, why bother? Instead, there, there has to be, you see, an answer. It, if the commandments of God are so high, then how do I get there? How is it even remotely possible? I mean, remotely possible. And, and you see, many of us live under this terribly mistaken notion that if I sort of look good and smile a lot and don't really tell anybody my secrets, maybe I'll get away with it. Maybe, maybe you won't notice that what's actually going on is that I'm looking good and I, I can talk a great game. But the real story is that inside my life, I feel an extraordinary amount of brokenness and guilt. And I know I can't get there. I keep showing up for church because I need something in my life. And maybe I'll get it through the Eucharist or something. But I need to tell you, the gap between what I feel like I'm supposed to be and who I really am inside is enormous. 
If you're in that place, I'm ready to talk to you. <laughs> you see, because if you're still in the place of just trying to try it harder, then you need to hear the impossibility of the scriptures. That's what Jesus especially is trying to do. You've heard it said you shouldn't murder. Well, that lets off most of us. Most of us. Um, but I say to you, if you're actually angry, in other words, I can just tell it. If you feel that inside, and there isn't a one of us who has not felt that, okay? So no sort of religious facades, all right? Then that means before the tribunal of God, I'm guilty of murder. Let's go home. See, Jesus' point is to try to say he's cutting into the very depths of the human heart. There is no sense, in other words, that I can put on the religious facade and kind of get away with it. We have this prayer, you see. If you come regularly to church, you know it, even though we're not doing it this morning. It's called the prayer, the collect for purity. Almighty God, to whom, what? All hearts are open, all desires go, from whom no secrets are hid. Well, there you are, you see. I can't pretend. The good news is, quite honestly, I don't want to. I want to know a God who knows me better than I know myself. I want to know a God with whom I can't pretend and get away with it. I want a God who sees me precisely as I am. Because if, if I'm known precisely as I am, without pretense, without falsehood, without incomplete information, because he is, in fact, all of them, then that means he can deal with me just as I am. He knows me, you see. So the gospel reading, all of those readings are meant to puncture the holes around our own self-dishonesty so that we can, in fact, come to God precisely as we are. The answer, the way it is laid out this morning, is actually not found in these scriptures. They're found in others, but it's encapsulated in the collect. Here's what I'd like you to do. Would you please turn in your prayer book? Page 216, 216. <laughs> For the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany. Thomas Cranmer, superb theologian that he was, wrote out what is in fact a fantastic prescription for how we deal with the very dilemma of the height of God's commandments and our own inability to be able to keep them. His answer is not cheerleading and trying harder. Instead, his answer is to call upon the grace of God that makes all the difference in the world. Notice, O oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in you. In other words, here's my dilemma, God. It's bigger than I am. So I have to turn to you for help. I can't make myself be any differently than I am. Oh, sure, I can change a few things. But the dilemma that is within the depths of my own human heart, I hardly know all that there is there. So I have to trust in you who know my heart perfectly. What does he say? Mercifully accept our prayers. In other words, please don't somehow think that my prayers are only going to be measured by how good I have been in the past 24 hours. You know, do you feel like that? Well, I've done pretty well, so maybe God will pay attention to me today. Or just the opposite. Oh, this morning didn't go very well. <laughs> I don't know whether God's going to want to talk to me or not. No, 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 no. Mercifully, in other words, based on God's mercy, Accept our prayers. And, here's the honesty, because in our weakness, we can do, notice the word, nothing. Pay attention to the adjective. We can do nothing good without you. What? Give us the help of your grace. What is grace? Grace is God's action in your life 
to give you precisely what you need, even though you don't ever deserve it. That's grace. The short term for it is unmerited favor. Because you see, that's exactly what I need. If I'm still in the position somehow of having to earn God's acceptance, I'm out of the game. The commandments are way too high. I need God to do something that I cannot do for myself. I need God to break into the very center of my life and give me that divine spark that I so desperately need. So that in the midst of both my successes, but especially in my failures, I might know that God is there, no matter what. And that God's favor toward me is not predicated on my behavior. If you think it is, then you need to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. See? No, we can't do that one, can we? See? I need God to break in and give me what? His grace. Because it is through His grace that I know forgiveness, whether I deserve it or not, the companionship of His presence, whether I qualify or not. And even the promise of eternal life, <clears throat> merely because I turn to Him and say, yes, in the midst of all of my shortcomings and failures. That's why we can go back to the scripture where I began. Come to me who? All of those who are doing really well? No. All who are weary. It means I'm trying and it's not working. And are heavy laden. The burdens of my own life are more than I can bear. And what does Jesus say? I will give you rest. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means the removal of the burden, the forgiveness in the midst of the guilt, mercy where I in fact should receive judgment. That's what God gives us in Jesus. That's all, that he, that's all we ever need, you see. And in so doing, this is the fun part, not only does he promise us the companionship of his presence, forgiveness that we do not deserve, mercy in time of need, it's not predicated on our behavior. And the good news is that grace actually begins to work a change in us. We begin to know and discover new things, good things, both our, about ourselves and about God, because we begin to see life in a different kind of way through the lens of a God who loves us and, and who cares for us and for whom we are, what does the scripture say? We are precious. It is so. I begin to discover in God the fact that I belong, that I'm welcomed, that I don't have to earn anything, and that out of that, oh, I want to do all that I can to serve him. See, that's the rest of the power. Give your help, the help of your grace that, in keeping your commandments, we may please you both in word and deed. In other words, that God might give me what I need to actually be able to live in a different kind of way. That's what the scriptures promise us. That's why when these are going to be presented for confirmation, reaffirmation, and reception, I will ask them to make some commitments. And their response is, I will, with God's help. <clears throat> because I need the companionship of His presence. I need God's grace to give me what I could never, ever deserve. And that is, in fact, His help. So, family of God, you who call yourself shepherd of the hills. What does it mean to be a part of a congregation that understands Jesus as a good, good shepherd? It's a congregation of people where you don't have to pretend. You can be yourself because you're loved and accepted. Where you don't have to be impressive because none of us, in fact, are very impressive in the presence of God. <coughs> But the good news is that he loves us just as we are. Where we know the joy of his companionship. Where we are free not only to experience his mercy 
and His forgiveness, but we're free to give it too. You see, I believe with all my heart, the world longs to know of a God that is that kind, that understanding, that full of compassion and mercy. But for many, maybe even here in this room, but they actually know of God as something very different. The one who demands, the one who exacts, the one who expects. And if you don't measure up well, too bad for you. That's not who we see in Jesus. That is not who we see in Jesus. And we are those who serve Jesus, our very good shepherd, who says, I have come that you, have, that you might have life and have it abundantly. And so today, as we renew our commitments to Christ, know that we are renewing that commitment to one who in fact promises to provide for our needs, to care for us in a way that we can never ever extend care to ourselves or to anyone else, who receives us as his own, who forgives us fully and completely without hesitation, and promises us out of all of that to give us the grace that we need. Because we need him so desperately. And he loves us so much, he will never turn us away. Let us pray again. Lord, I thank you. You love us enough to punch holes in our own pretenses, our own abilities to somehow, sadly, be impressive. And that instead we can come to you without that. We can just be ourselves. And that that's what you want. That you long to receive us as we are. That we might know in that place of transparency and honesty, your love, your mercy, your beauty, your companionship, your grace. So we thank you, O oh Lord, for such a gracious and wondrous invitation that we might in the end know that companionship and that joy. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen.